I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today, I'm here with Julianne Peterson. Uh, she is the Senior Director for Old Capital Lending, the leading nationwide mortgage broker. Um, and, and first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming on the show. I, I'm, I'm really excited for this discussion. I am thrilled. Thank you so much for including me in your network and I, you know I, uh, an opportunity to help. I think th- this is going to be super valuable for well, so selfishly for me, but also for <laughs> for the listeners. Um, so, why don't you kind of give everyone your background, kind of kind of let us know how you got into the space, um, and we'll we'll talk. I think we have a ton of things we can talk about here. So oh, I'll let fantastic. you get started, and then we'll we'll dive in wherever it seems to take us. Oh, terrific. I'll, I'll, I'll go off on a tangent. If I do, you bring me right back. So again, my name is Julianne Peterson. I'm with Old Capital Lending. We are a premier provider of debt for multifamily, although we will go into other asset classes within the commercial real estate uh, area, but um, I really do focus a lot more of my efforts in multifamily. We've closed 6,000 loans. That's a lot of loans, by the way. We closed $1.2 billion in loans last year, and there's only eight of us. And I'll tell you, the last quarter, we probably did three quarters of our business in those last three months. So it was a crazy year. Um, lots of opportunity for new folks. Also, you know, lots of opportunity for people that have been doing this for a very long time. I got my start about 30, 31 years ago, and uh, I, I said to myself, I do not want to pay a landlord any money. I want to buy my own assets. So when I was 22, I bought my first property in Los Angeles. And uh, actually, I was selling bicycles at the time for a a manufacturer. And my uh, my bike shops that I went to go in LA, um, they got looted when we had the... um, the riots that came through LA and I lost three of my largest dealers. They just closed up and, and, and went home and said, you know, we'll pick up another business, you know, down the road. So I had to make a choice. Um, Do I give back my house? Do I sell it? Or uh, the other choice I came up with is I gave it to a friend. It's $250,000 house. I was 22 and I, I got an opportunity to go, through my bike industry uh, up to the Bay Area. So I called up a friend and I said, hey, you want to take my house? He's like, I only have $4,000. So I said, here, give me the money. I'll give you the house. You got to make the payments. And he did. He did it for 12 years. I was on the loan the entire time. He made every payment. It was fantastic. Uh, I also had a second out on the house because I was a young investor and they wanted to make sure that I had 20% down. So I took out an additional loan, which I ended up paying. A lot of people said, hey, that was a risk they took in a, de- in a market that was just starting to, to, to take a dive. But I, you know, karma will kill you. So I, I ended up paying that um, over the you know, next couple, three, four years. And I found my husband um, in the Bay Area and we bought our first home together. And we ended up renting that, moved to Chicago. And we rented that for five years, doubled our money. So from being in a negative position with real estate to a very positive uh, relationship in, in uh, real estate, you know, I've, I've run through the good and the bad and the evil. So I bring something very special and different to my community that I uh, provide this experience, this, uh, you know, I've been through the trenches, started buying multifamily back in 2005. And we bought, we ended up uh, taking some of the money out of the property in the Bay Area and bought uh, apartments in Chicago. 
2005 was on the cusp of going down to 2008, and we went into negative AM. So that means our homes, our properties were worth less than what we owed. So it took us 11 years to get out of that, made $50,000 at the end of 11 years. So you can only imagine how much I just wanted to get rid of that and yeah. buy a bunch of more properties. It was, it was uh, you know, again, ups and downs in, in real estate. Uh, ended up bringing the capital over to where I am now in San Diego, bought multifamily here, held on to it for five years. In the midst of that, started buying more in multifamily as a limited partner, not just as a owner operator. And we uh, found that, you know what, I needed to do more of doing limited partners and and really developing my skill. Um, All along, I had been doing transactions, uh, mortgage transactions, got into, we've got four children. So uh, entered into this about uh, eight years ago into the multifamily as a mortgage broker. And it just wasn't time for us yet. Our kids were still young. So about five years ago, got back into mortgage and um, started, again, more limited partnerships and recently have sold all of my uh, my own multifamilies of the smaller multis and uh, am going into a general partnerships um, outside of the great state of California. Because as you know, it's not a great place to be buying multifamily. It just yeah. is not making sense. You got landlord tenant rights. And uh, I I had one eviction in 30 years. So I'm I'm grateful for that. I I, I was a very good landlord, but my husband was ready to hang up the uh, the tool belt <laughs> and yeah. uh, let other people run our business. So I you know in in all and I think it was only a couple of weeks ago we've we've uh, sold all of those probably couple within the last couple of years I actually did tenants in common did a ten thirty one I mean again I have some great experience that I can share for so many investors that they say hey have you ever done a ten thirty one well, that's easy. You go 1031 from house to house, but a 1031 into a syndication doesn't always happen that often. And so I have that experience as well. And uh, it was a, only a, probably a couple months ago that I, I finally said to my husband, I, I just do not miss being a landlord. <laughs> so it did take a couple of years to say, okay, I'm done. It's, I mean, I'm really, this was a, a a great choice. So that's a little bit about me um, in terms of what I am doing in multifamily. Um, I I run a Zoom call every Tuesday. It's called Zoom at 8. And um, the reason I started this is because there are a lot of education programs out there. And these education programs A lot of them are to help you understand how to underwrite these deals, or they have you come in and be just an investor. But there are other companies that you can spend thirty to fifty, a hundred thousand dollars that have an ecosystem whereby you can invest, you can learn, you can find your sponsor, you can find all of your investors. And I thought that was fantastic. And so what I did. Three years ago, is there were some uh, uh, of these education programs that didn't have that system. So I, I developed the Zoom at eight, and we have closed eleven deals just with the people in the rooms. Um, that the people will come and they'll get to know the audience. I, I help educate them. I bring in experts in this field, and. Um, you know, it really is about who you know and the relationships you build. And it's a proven track record that um, we're doing something right, um, having the fact that we've got, you know, 11 deals that have closed within this community. It's it's very cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's awesome. And that's that's a, a great sort of testament to that group and to you for putting it together. But also, I mean, listening to that, that's like, we need to get into this group, right? It's like if you're trying to <laughs> trying to get started doing deals, this yeah. is the way to do it: is to to build your network and get into get into these different masterminds and uh, however you know whatever it takes, really, right? To connect with people and kind of build that build that network. Um, I, I usually tell people two things to get started in this business: two things that you need to do. One is educate. 
So whatever that looks like, depends on how fast you want to accelerate. You know, some people want to take it slow. You can do this all on your own for free. You just, you know, talk and meet people or you get into one of these education programs. That's your number one most important thing is educate yourself to make the right decisions with the money that you have. Number two is to be a limited partner. You're learning, but you're also investing because of, of course, we're in inflationary times right now. And so you're 100,000 that's sitting there and you're saying, but wait, I want to be a general partner is losing money every minute it sits yeah. there. So you got to know how to execute that on a, you know where to deploy that capital but you want to do it as a limited partner don't wait for the general partnership deploy that capital and see how these syndicators or your general your your um your joint venture partners are communicating with you as a limited partner okay because how will you ever know what to communicate unless you've seen it done professionally so I, again, two things, educate and be a limited partner will really make you uh, educate. We'll, we'll, we'll find your place in this community. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I think that the being a limited partner, you know, assuming you have some capital to deploy is really valuable because you can, you can see how the other sponsors are doing things and you can say, I like that, or I don't like that. And that, exactly. you know, I can use those things in my own business. When I have my own deals, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to run my deals? What type of communications? How do I, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do I conduct my investor relations, that sort of thing. So I think that's a very great uh, piece of advice and a valuable example in that, that it's, it's a really good thing to do in the beginning, because the other thing is, you know, if you've got that money sitting there and you want to be the general partner, it might take a while. Absolutely. Right? It might take you six months, a year, 18 months to get that first deal. And so meanwhile, as you mentioned, inflation's eating up the money that you have. So yeah. why not get it, you know, get it invested so it's it's making you some cash flow, it's growing and and then you know you work towards getting your own deals somewhere along the way. So absolutely. I, think that's and I, that's I would tell you, there are people that started being a limited partner 18 months ago, and they've doubled their money. And so yeah. some of these deals do take you 18 months to get in as a general partner. So you right. just missed doubling your money. So I think that that's going to be maybe short lived over the next year, year and a half. I think that that's possible. Beyond that, you know, we can't, we, we don't know, we can't see into the future, but speculation would say that it's probably around the corner when that's your, your deployment of capital is not going to be as great. The returns yeah. on it. Yeah. I think the, we can, I guess that's a good topic to talk about as someone who sees this stuff directly. Um, the, <laughs> the future forecast of you know kind of what's going on the, the market right now is is has been for the last year or more you know sort of especially in the last year or more incredibly hot prices are driving up cap rates are compressing it's hard to find deals that that if you're being at least semi conservative makes sense on paper the, those deals are are tough to find and so you know since you brought it up and and I, I think I agree with you in in the sense like where do you see this going you know from your perspective how how do you see this kind of shaking out? Well, um, now listen, uh, my crystal ball broke down probably about a year and a half ago, and they're <laughs> out of stock in Walmart, and I can't seem to find a new one. So I'll 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 do what I can to help you understand <laughs> where we are coming from. These are these are not promises. These are <laughs> these are <laughs> opinions. Do not make. That's my, that's my disclaimer, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, hey, listen, uh, all all economists, everything is saying. Keep going, keep going for the next year. We're, we are experiencing um, interest rates increasing. 80% of our business today is done with bridge lending. Okay. Yeah. Two years ago, bridge lending was, wasn't, it, it was out of business actually. When COVID hit, most of the bridge lenders, they closed down or they just didn't get any business. And uh, well, I mean, even so, 
it was crazy for there about six weeks where nothing really was happening. But, you know, these lenders, especially agency, put into place a lot of uh, stop gaps to protect the capital. Um, but over the last 18 months, the way to go, why? Because the pricing is so high, agency is only giving you 50, 60, 70, maybe percent LTV, loan to value. Okay. So that means that all you need to bring in is 30, 35, 40, 45% of a down payment. Well, that can be a heck of a lot of money. And if you're new, you don't have capital raisers, you don't have the experience. So a lot of these new investors are going into the bridge loans that will roll in the rehab. So you're saying you you need to put $10,000 a door in rehab. Well, we're going to roll that into the, the loan. Whereas with agency, you have to capital raise the additional $10,000 a door. Yep. So that gets prohibitively difficult to do. So that's why there's been this shift. And the rate caps, which is like an, in, an insurance policy that we put on the loan, basically you are responsible to pay the mortgage between what it is today because these interest rates are adjustable. So let's just take, for instance, today, um, interest rates on on a uh, bridge loan, and it depends on how big and everything is dependent on the sponsor, the property, the opportunity, all of that. Let's just say it's 4%. Today's environment, you have to put this rate cap on and a, an affordable rate cap is, let's say, a 3% strike. That means this insurance policy will not kick in at 5%, at 6%, will not kick in, and it'll, it has to pass 7%, because you've got the interest rate of 4 plus a 3% strike. So once it goes over seven, let's say it goes to 725, now that interest, that rate cap will kick in. How much? A quarter percent or whatever it is over that seven. Now, if you've only run your numbers and your underwriting at 4% and you haven't looked at the numbers at five and six and six and a half and six and three quarters, you're going to need to pay that interest only payment. And you've got three years to get this done in many cases. And what happens with supply chain? And what happens if you know something happens where we've got an, uh, an employment shutdown? Have you thought about that? So the bridge loan is an amazing product. I love it. But the thing is, we have so many people who have entered into this community over the last two years especially in COVID, people were looking at their watches saying, how many years am I going to be sitting in my house with nothing to do because my employer says I can stay home? Right. They all jumped into this, right? And so they have been working for two years and I got an opportunity and I'm going for bridge, but they're not looking at the whole picture. Yeah. And so I caution you because again, I love this product. It is amazing. I'm a general partner in a deal that we just closed in Houston. We use this. We use this product. But what you want to be really aware of is two things. The interest rate, how long can, I, can we hold this interest rate? And they are going up. I mean, we, we're, we're getting an interest rate of three quarters of a percent almost daily on some of these quotes. I mean, it's it's nuts. So, but you need to also be aware of, um, you know, how long can I, uh, you know, if I've got my property management company, do they have the relationships with the people that are going to be providing all of the fixtures, all of the, the there's been short supply on many of these things. Yeah. And I have three years to get this business plan done. So it's really critical to be looking at who your partners are uh, in, in all of this, right? But in particular, 
your partner on the property management is critical. And if they're new, you might want to keep looking because they might not be able to execute for you, even just based on the relationships that, that they have with their suppliers. I mean, it's real. This is critical. A lot of people are not talking about this. Yeah. No, I, those are all I'm not great here to points. bear the bad the 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 bad news, but I mean I just want it's, you to it's just realize. reality. It's yeah. it's what it is right now. And yeah. Let, let's just maybe if you would we'll back up a little bit. I think coming from someone who is actually a lender, what, will you sort of define bridge debt versus agency debt for people uh-huh. that because it those are terms that I think, you know, maybe when you're starting out, you hear those things tossed around and you're like yeah. Okay, great. I get it. I get it. But I, I, it's it's not nearly as simple as like, here's these two options. Um, so maybe you can give a little definition to that. Sure. Piece. Absolutely. So, and by the way, I just love all this. I mean, I just have so much passion for it and educating people that are new. That's a lot of my businesses with new folks. So there are four different vehicles that you can use to get deals done. There's bank lending. So that's your local bank, your credit union. This is recourse lending. This will go on your credit score. This will go on your balance sheet. So if you're buying a house and you're putting all of this debt, oh, if you're putting all of this debt on your your balance sheet, if you that house that you thought maybe you were going to buy a million dollar house, you've got this apartment now on your credit, you may not be able to get that big house. So you need to be aware of that. That's recourse lending. The next one that we have is bridge. And it's simply that. It's bridging you from unstable. Maybe it's 75%. Maybe it actually is 90% occupied instead of 75% occupied. It's 90%, but you need to do some renovations. And you need to get rid of the old property manager because they're not raising the rents. So that would be a great solution would be a bridge loan. And these bridge loans are short. They're two to three years. And these are non-recourse bridges that I'm talking about. Now, you can get recourse bridges, which is just like that bank. But what we really like to to encourage people to use is the non-recourse. Because while you're a guarantor and you're signing your name, there are carve-outs that will keep you you know, if you are making some bad choices and making some illegal decisions, we're coming after you. It can switch from non-recourse to recourse. So with non-recourse bridge, three years, we actually, it's only interest only, right? So you don't have to pay the principal and you can have it for three years. So you're bringing in all of this capital, but you're also asking people to move or Maybe you need them to move to another property so or another unit because you want to renovate their property. So it's, it, there's a lot of shifting and moving, and you need to have a, a solid team that has done this in the past. You can't be doing putting your, your, yourself at risk without teammates that know what they're doing. So recourse or non-recourse bridge, you're usually getting between 70 and 75 percent loan to value. And then on the rehab, so you've got this $200,000 rehab or you've got a $2 million rehab. I can throw that onto the loan and I can pay, I can give you 75 to 100% of that budget in in the loan dollars. So that's fantastic. You know, so you you could potentially be at 80%, 82, depending on how much. The loan is that you've got loan to cost then, and it's much higher. So you could basically have an amazing amount of money coming in, very little going out. You do your renovations, but you have three years to do it. Now, there's also the ability to get additional years. Each You get two additional years, one at a time. And for each one of those additional years, you have to pay 1%. What people forget is there are application fees which are 50 to a 50 to $75,000. You have that rate cap we talked about, that insurance policy. Oh my goodness. These have gone up too. So on that 
deal that I was just talking about a deal. We started out at $30,000 for the rate cap and it cost us 129 when we closed. That's how volatile these rate caps are. And so you need to be thinking about that. And the, you, you can't buy those three weeks in advance or three months in advance. You, you buy them a day in advance. So if the markets are high, you're going to pay that. And I, I, I suggest that those are going to continue to, to increase. Yeah. So you have that. Uh, a lot of times they'll have a DACA, which means a deposit and clearing account. And in some of these, so like these bridge loans can be considered people that just have a bunch of money that are lending them out. Well, they want to make sure that they get paid. So they put this DACA, this deposit and clearing account, where all of the deposits, all of your income is deposited into this DACA. And then the bank will then give you the remainders. They'll pay all of your bills and they'll give you what is left. That can seem a little bit of maybe confining or maybe, you know, big brother-ish. Some of these debt funds, they won't, they won't care about that until you default. Okay. So these are just some things to be thinking about um, when you're considering like what are the costs? And typically the the closing cost fees are around four percent. So they're a little bit higher in closing costs. Okay, there's a, typically a fee of 1% to go in, and there's a 1% to go out. Um, and we can waive some of those, but it, you know, it just depends on what's your next step. What you have to be thinking about when you're looking at lending is wh- who, what's the next step? So if you've got a bridge loan, what are you going to do with it after at the maturity? Am I selling it or am I going to get another loan after that as as I stabilize this. And what is that loan going to look like? Well, if you're in a very small community where you've got five or 6,000 people or even 20,000 people, it's going to be hard to get really good financing because you're in the middle of nowhere. So in that case, you'd want to go to a, 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 a local bank. Remember, local bank is recourse. So you always have to be thinking, what product do I am I going to use on this property? If I really like this property, what it, what are the consequences of doing financing on this on this property? So you always think about that. Now let's move to agency. Agency is your gold standard in syndication in multifamily. It came about probably 15, 16 years ago when banks were the only ones that were doing it. It was recourse. An agency, which is a government-backed securities, they came in and said, I want to participate in this. And that's when the syndication model came in and said, you too can own apartment buildings. It's not just the rich and famous. It's simply you and I, middle-class people, even the lower class can own apartment buildings. So agency is fantastic. Short five year, seven year, 10 year loans. Okay. You can have interest only that we do have 12 year loans as well. You've got one year interest only, two years interest only, three years interest only. But here is the problem recently, I'm only talking recently, is that when our our net operating income. Now, remember, these are businesses that we're running. The net operating income, we have to look at and see what's happened in the past. All right. And a lot of times with agency, they want to see that you can have, you can, you can cover the debt service. Debt service means your mortgage. So in large areas of the country, in major markets, in your Dallas, in your Los Angeles, in your Boston, in your Tampa, in your Jacksonville, large markets, they want to make sure that you cover it, the mortgage, and have some extra debt service coverage ratio. So typically, it's 1.25 in these larger markets. Well, what's happening is that net operating income is low compared to the pricing. 
So what they need to do is they need to keep hitting the proceeds, the, the leverage until it hits the coverage. You're 1.25 or 1.35, right? And what happens? Your proceeds go down. So a lot of these agency loans now since COVID and since bridge and, and all the pricing is so high, your leverage on agency is 50, 60, 70. Now I've, I've closed some recently at 75, but they have to be great, well uh, uh, working. Uh, the net operating income needs to be solid. Okay. The income has to be, you know, not a lot of, uh, of uh, economic vacancy, economic uh, problems, any concessions, all of that. Okay. When we look at agency, we're looking backwards. How did this property perform over the T12? T12 is uh, your last 12 months. So as a lender, we're looking at T3, which is the last three months, and we want to see it improving. It's not improving. We go to T6. Hopefully, hopefully we see it better. T T nine and T twelve. We're we're looking over the entire, uh, uh, the whole, uh, what do I want to say? Life cycle of the year. Okay. When you look at bridge, we're not. We are considering what's happening just from a okay today's in place, but we're really looking out into the future. That's called a pro forma. What are we going to do with this property today? To get to year three pro forma, when we need to get it stabilized and into another uh, uh, bank uh, product, if you will. So you got to remember your pro forma with agency doesn't really, we don't really care. What we really want to see is the performance of that asset in the last three months. And that will dictate what your uh, proceeds are. Now, typically, we see 60 days to close, right? That It's usually 60 days from the time we have an application to the time we close. So that gives you two months for the seller to improve. Now, I don't know if about you, but when I sell my house, I no longer clean all the closets and all, right. all the garbage, right? right? It kind of goes away, your, you know, your yes. care, because you're on to the next thing. So it's really important to encourage your sellers to keep their foot on the gas because that is going to determine your proceeds. Isn't that crazy? I mean, they have so much control over how much money we get on the yeah. loan. It, yeah. That's nuts. I mean, that's, a, that's actually a really great point because I was burned by that, right? We, uh -huh. had, we had a deal that the, the seller hadn't really had their foot on the gas at all, but <laughs> mm -hmm. they especially took their foot off the gas once we got under contract. And so it actually burned us on, on our original, uh, we were originally going to get agency debt and it had to switch to bridge debt kind of at the last moment. It almost fell apart because of that experience, because of exactly what you're talking about right now. I'm, I'm in the midst of negotiating another deal. And I said, there are going to be stipulations <laughs> that that doesn't happen. Like basically you have to maintain a certain level of occupancy, any new leases, that kind of thing, because it's just too, it's, it's too risky to kind of leave it in their hands. And, and, and you're right. Yeah. If you're selling it, what do you care anymore? It's not exactly. And it, and it, it can have such a big impact on that lending piece that it, it's, it's kind of hugely important that it, it be, I think, explicitly spelled out and it, you know, Maybe not in every deal you'll be able to get it explicitly spelled out, but but it's something that I think to look at. So well, that's a listen. Great point. At the end of the day, you want that property, right? And and the seller says, oh, "I took my foot out of the gas. What are you going to do? Right. I'm gonna, you're going to fine him, really? Because right. you got yeah. ten other people behind you that he'll sell it for more than he sold it to you for. So you're in a precarious situation. But what that leads me to say is. Here is an example. And a lot of people say, I'm going direct to the bank. I'm going to have a relationship directly with a bank. Okay. In your situation, this is a, a, an amazing example of why you want to work with a mortgage broker. 
because a mortgage broker opens up their their coat and they've got all of these op- options, yep. right? Yep. And they're working on behalf of you. And when they put you in front of a bank or you know a lender, and that lender at you know the eleventh hour says, "I'm sorry, that's I can't get you." You can pivot, and that broker can help you. You could be left out in you know with your pants down, as they say, without if you're going direct without any options. And that can be very expensive because you have all of this money, money that's now hard into the deal. So that thank you for bringing that up because that's a critical piece. And here's the other thing that you want to be really careful with. And I, I'm, I'm going to little toot my horn, but you have to be really careful when you're working with brokers or, or banks. Okay. It's super important. We as lenders, as brokers, We are your biggest partner because we're bringing the majority of the capital to the transaction. Okay, so that relationship is 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 critical and it's important. Um, I'm bringing this up because um, one of the things that I have seen in the marketplace is people will say, "Hey, I can get you eighty percent loan to value." And and you're going down. You know, this is your friend, or you just met him, and you know, you've maybe called a bunch of other people. And this guy is at eighty percent. I'm going to hang my hat with that guy because he's at eighty percent. Well, in some cases, this person bought your business. He looked at the transaction, but said, "I can get 80. And when the rubber hits the road, I may have said, "No, I can only get to seventy-five." This lender or this broker says, oh, by the way, 10 days before close, I can only get you 75. And now you're left telling your investors that, by the way, that 0.33 shares that you just purchased is now only worth 0.25. And I need to bring in uh, some more investors. So it's not worth as much. And you're scrambling. And so forth. So that's why it's it's imperative that you work with a banker, with a broker that has very good relationships with banks that can say, really, where is this going to transact? Do you see any problems with this? Yeah. It's, it, it, it will make or break your transaction. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you brought up, I mean, a couple of good points there. One of them is that uh, you, you touched on this, but the lender is the biggest partner in the deal, right? So, you know, the lender is funding 75% probably, like just pick that number, that's a a reasonable one, 75% of the purchase price and and with these bridge loans, maybe even more than that. But essentially, so so no other investor is coming in with anywhere near that. So that's a a good point, I think, actually, for for people that are, uh, you know, sort of acting as limited partners, you know, people like to, well, is this safe? I'm worried about it. You know, what, you know, where's, but the lender just put up 75% of that money. And so if, if that bank thinks it's a good deal, that's probably a pretty good indicator. It's going to be a pretty good deal. The, so, because the banks can say no, right. And I, I, I don't know how often you yeah. get deals brought to you that, you know, you're like, no, no one's going to fund that. That's not, <laughs> that's crazy out of the ballpark. That's never going to work, yep. but it's, it, if if they like the deal and, and like as someone sort of bringing deals to to these to the brokers it's like when a, when a broker says yeah i think this looks really good that that makes you feel like you're on the right track because they're going to be the most scrutinizing they're going to be the most you know sort of detail oriented as far as how 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 willing they are to to lend against that that asset and it it the other Part that I just wanted to clarify for people is the the recourse versus non recourse lending mm-hmm. and with recourse essentially it just means whether or not you're responsible if the loan defaults and so you talked a bit about the the bad boy carve outs like if you're doing things illegal you're not going to get away with being non recourse but right. those those non recourse loans means that again the lender believes so much in this deal that they're willing to say. Hey, listen. If you screw it up, I'll just take the property <laughs> mm-hmm. because that, and that's. I mean, it's it's a 
there, there's a lot of, you know, I think people that are new to investing as limited, part, limited partners, and rightly so, have a lot of trepidation and fear. Oh, I'm, this is probably the biggest investment I've ever made at one time in my life. Like, but I think some of those points might actually be something to look at from a, hey, it, it's probably okay from a safety standpoint that here, here's this, you know, so some very large bank or lender is is willing to be a part of it. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you would think that that's sort of a true statement, but that, oh, that's yeah, kind of absolutely. My and, you know, again, I've got lots of lenders, right? And so we know what markets this lender likes and what they don't like. There are, you know, people want to go and get an opportunity and it might be in an area where a bank just doesn't want it. So yeah, I got a deal. That's great. But what's the lending going to look like? And I, I, but I know I can get 75. Well, maybe not. Maybe you are really more of a 60, 65. And I do want to take a minute here and touch on what are the regulations or what are the expectations when you're getting an agency loan? Okay. What, what are the requirements? Mm-hmm. Okay, you're new to this. Yep. What do you what kind of partners do you need to put on your team to be able to get a deal done? Okay? So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about agency. Now, Bridge is going to have similar requirements. But agency is really again is your gold standard. So let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. We're looking at 90% occupied for 90 days. You have to have that. That's the only way that agency will look at a loan, okay, at doing a loan. Secondly, you need net worth, okay, whether that's from one person or a a collaboration of the teammates who are going to be signing on the loan. You need a net worth greater than the loan amount. So let's take, for instance, a $10 million deal. In San Diego, that's probably five units. If you're in Texas, maybe a hundred. So $10 million deal. I'm going to give you a 75% loan to value loan on that proceeds. Okay. So now you're at a loan amount of $7.5 million. I need from you or your group $7.5 million. Okay. It's greater than, so one, you know, and one dollar. So seven seven point five million, okay. So you, when you're thinking about, hey, it's really easy to say, I'm going to buy ten million dollar deals between ten and fifteen million, yeah. but what is it going to take? So there's one thing I need to have somebody who has seven point five million on my team. Where are they? Who are they? You haven't found them yet. Keep looking. The third piece is liquidity. I need 10% that's cash in the bank, that's marketable securities, that's your cash value of your your insurance policy, your life insurance policy. It's your Google stock, okay? And even crypto can be looking, you've got a cash value of crypto. Take a picture of it. That needs to be 10% of that loan amount. So again, we're at $10 million deal, 7.5, I need 10%. That's $750,000 sitting in a bank. And we call that post-close. That money cannot be used for the down payment. It has to be there when you close. Now, in 22 minutes after you close, you can go spend it. But the lender needs to see a statement that says this is here. Okay. And the last one, which can be difficult, and all of us have to start someplace, is two years of experience in multifamily or in commercial real estate with three to five transactions. Now, recently I had a transaction going for Freddie. They had been in multifamily for 22 months. Freddie said, sorry, can't give it to you. Can't give you the loan. It's not 24 months. And kind of carried on and carried on, went to another broker. The broker said, yes, I can do this for you. Three weeks later, after we were under contract, 
person came back and said that that broker said, "Mm, sorry, I can't help you. What she said (laughs) is the truth. You need two years, 24 months. How many minutes, how many days is that? You have to have experience. Okay. So be aware of that. Now you need to have one person with two years. You can, you know, they're going to, it's not like you've got five, five months and you got six months and I got a month, a year. It needs to be a solid two years, three to five transactions. Now keep this in mind, my friends, people are doing capital raising. I am a co-sponsor. These are people that have said, I can raise a million. I'm going to get to have some general partnership shares, right? Are we all, we all know about this kind of new strategy? Remember the SEC Securities and Exchange Commission says, if you're on the general partnership, you need a job. These people are coming in. They don't have jobs. They are saying, I'm a co-sponsor. When the rubber hits the road, if somebody doesn't get paid with distributions, they're going to start looking for the people that are making money on this deal who are not doing a job. So make sure you are covering yourself. I bring this up because those people that are signing on the loan as guarantors, they are general partners. These people that are coming in and banks say that is your two years experience. These capital raisers that are coming in as co-sponsors who are not signing on the loan, that does not show up as experience with a lender. Be very, very aware of that. Yeah, you've got to be you've got to be on the loan, right? It's it's got to be a part you have of it control. to qualify in your in your uh experience yep. that for that experience criteria. And I'm actually really glad, glad you brought it up because that, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next is kind of yeah. how that the, the, you know, sort of strictness of agency debt versus bridge debt and bridge debt has similar uh, oh, yes. requirements. Yes. They're just maybe, uh, maybe there's a little more bend in some of those rules, but the agency debt they're, they're not it, there. As you said, you know, perfect example, they had 22 months, yep. They're not gonna. They're not gonna bend on it. It's gonna have to happen. And so, yeah. your earlier you had said that you've you're doing essentially eighty percent bridge debt right now. And it, and it, and am I correct me if I'm wrong? My assumption is that's because the prices are so kind of elevated right now. Cap rates are so compressed that it's it's hard to hit the metrics that agency debt wants you to do or wants to see on that DSCR. And so now you've got these, uh, as you mentioned before, the the lower loan to value loans. And so that makes a huge difference in the returns. Right. So oh, yeah. that that's what people I think, you know, if, if you ever if you've ever underwritten a deal, just try changing it from 75 to 65% Never. LTV. And it your your uh your investor returns are going to drop tremendously just based on that. So I guess my my question is, do you see a scenario where like agency debt was formed because they, you put it well, they wanted to be a part of this. Do you see a scenario where agency debt gets a little bit more lenient on those things because now everybody's using a different debt product because they just nobody can qualify? And, and, and this is ignoring the fact that we expect at some point there will be some sort of market correction. But yeah. like, do you see a scenario where they lighten up on that at all? Or do you think that's just going to be, it's, it's the government it's going to, they're going to, yeah. it's going to be what it is. Yeah. I, I again, my crystal ball is broken. <laughs> right. um, I think what's going to happen is yes, the correction is coming. And I do think that it, at some point, and we are s- definitely seeing it in the last even two weeks with the rate, caps being so, so, so expensive that it doesn't, it, it's just like outpriced itself, these these uh, bridge loans. And so at some point you have to say, well, uh, I'm going to have to go another route. And maybe that route is a bank or it's going to be agency and the agency is going to be 
you're going to have lower leverage. And it is what it is. You're going to have to capital raise. So I think, you know, with that, there there's going to be a a loss of some of these new investors that can't hold on, that can't play in this field, that you know aren't going to be able to find the deals um, that make sense because they don't have the experience, the net worth, and the liquidity. Yeah. Right? They're all scrambling to find it. Um, I, I don't think they're going to change. Uh, I, I don't see that in the foreseeable future. Um, hey, listen there, we still need places for people to live. There's not enough inventory coming on board. I think we're still, you know, a couple years out from really having more inventory coming on board. And I think there's going to be a big difference. And I think there's going to be a a change. Um, The rates just keep going up. Um, you know, the forward curve that we're looking at uh, with SOFR, with the index, we're looking at next year being at one. Right now, it's 0.5 being at one. And then in two years, in 2025, 24, it's going to be at two. So there's a lot of what, what's going to, I think, clear out some of these bridge loans People are not going to be able to execute them. And I think there's going to be opportunities there because it's going to be difficult to go from a bridge loan to another bridge loan um, or for the bank to say, oh, I'll give you some more time. I mean, at, where, at what point does it become ineffective, uh, right? I mean, you, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I still think that there's a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah, for sure. And I think. Yeah, those are great points. It, like, ultimately, at some point, <laughs> you know, the, the prices can't go up forever the way that they have. It, it just doesn't seem, un- unless I guess the I guess the unless to this is if, and you're seeing this, but if the investors, like the limited partners, are willing to take smaller returns. Well, and that's the that's the thing. You, making five percent is much better. Than in your bank account. Sure. So, yeah, it's not going to be the 20% cash on cash returns. We've already seen that come down to 10. We're now going to see that coming down to eight. We've seen that even going down to six on eight and four. So, I I think it's just we're going to see a change and it is what it is. And there's still tax benefits, right? And there's, there's still increases in rents. So we'll see. Yeah. 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 It, and that's, I mean, ultimately it's probably going to be some balance of all those factors. And I, I too do not have a crystal ball and I would imagine your yeah. crystal ball would be way better than mine, but it's, <laughs> it's something that is things will, things will change. Things will level off. There will be other increases in the market. There will be other decreases in the market. And, and the trick is, are you someone that can kind of ride through those on in the good and the bad And being, you know, as you've mentioned, just being sort of hyper aware of of what your debt product is, how that's going to look in two or three years, what's, you know, again, nobody can predict that future, but ultimately you do, I I think what we've seen a lot with such low interest rates is, and and the flood of people in this industry is is just Mm -hmm. that, like, people are overpaying for things based on, you know, some speculation well listen strong desire to get in the business and it, it, it it's jason you could make tons of mistakes over the last two years and you became rich so you know the it it, it really is more of the opportunity was here people took it um they made lots and lots and lots of money yeah. um if they really looked at it in a downturn, do you think that they may have made those mistakes would have cost them? Absolutely. So, you know, here, here's what I'll leave you with. Every one of us who are looking to be general partners on deals, you need teammates. You need people that have done this for a while on your team as a sponsor, someone who has that net worth, that liquidity, the experience. What you fail to realize is when you get more than two or three people on a team, nobody can make a decision. 
Nobody plays well. And it is at the risk and the non-reward of your investors who take the, the hit of your decisions and your um, uh, inability to be good partners. Um, the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is that partners are not getting along. Okay, They can't decide what color red goes on the front doors and it's delaying their budget it's delaying their delivery at the property management and the property management is being held accountable for the budget. And then they fire the, the, the uh, property management because it's their fault. They're not looking at, okay, who are my partners? Who's making, who's in charge of this decision? And are, do, are we, do we have the same mission, vision and values to work together as a strong team that supports each other and supports the deal and supports our investors. Always, if you're a limited partner, you got to look under the hood. You have to understand how long these partnerships have been together. You have to find out how long people have been in business. What is their track record? Because you can have the best deal but if the partners are not aligned, it doesn't matter. You're going to be at risk of losing your capital for what because these people can't get along. It's yeah. it's a critical piece. Not a lot of people talk about it. We're seeing you know a lot of that behind the scenes. Um, I'm I'm aware of uh, of these relationships, and it it is unfortunate. So pick your f- friends, pick your teammates. It, this is the long game. Yeah. This doesn't happen overnight. You don't have to have a thousand units by Tuesday. Be in this, make good long-term decisions that will pay off in over time. Yeah. Don't count no, your pennies. It's it's exactly true. I mean, the the you know, a lot of people there there has been a lot of people into the business recently. I'm including myself in that. You make, mm-hmm. you know, people making partnerships based on just Hey, I need help. I know I can't do this myself. Yeah. You also want to do it. Let's let's do this together without necessarily yeah. knowing. And, and so you've got to work through you've got to work through those relationships that are maybe formed in a hurry. And you've got to be able to be accountable. Yes. Everybody has to be accountable to each other. You've got to be accountable to the investors. You know, I think that that example of of you know people firing their property management because things aren't going well. You really need to look internally and say, okay. I'm the one who is responsible here, right? And say, yes, there may be, it's not saying every property management group is perfect, but like, what are the issues and how can I fix them and work through that with the property management group, I think is is an incredibly important component of this business. So uh, yeah, great point. And, and I, I am uh, a big believer in accountability. I, I uh, that, that book, Jocko Willick's, um, extreme ownership. I, I think it's, mm. it's, you know, just, you can tell by the name what it's about if you haven't read it, but it's essentially yeah. just being super, you know, hyper accountable for everything. How, if something goes wrong, whether you were even involved, how, how could I have made it better? How could I have, for, you know, maybe foreseen that? Um, but you know, but that's, that is just a, um, it, it comes out of, you know, somebody's not accountable because maybe they don't like you. And so they're letting things go by the wayside. They're not holding themselves accountable because there's an internal struggle. Well, you didn't look at me nice. You didn't call me nice. You know, it's all this stuff and you didn't call me on Saturday. Well, I like to work on Saturdays. How come you didn't call me back? I mean, simple stuff like that can fester and therefore I'm, you're unaccountable. So find out what the core problem is and know it. Learn it before you get into business. You learn and you meet tons of people at these conferences, and that's great. See them over the next year and make friendships with these people. But don't jump into a long-term five-year relationship where you know you find out in in eighteen months that no way. In fact, again, last thing I'm going to say. I have an investor that is willing to lose $3 million of his investor's money. He, he and his partner uh, 
sold the property at a $3 million loss because they could not get along. That's a problem. That's not right at at the owner at the investor's expense. So the, these are real these are real life uh, stories. So uh, we could talk all day, I'm sure. But you know, ultimately, I think you know, just to wrap this up, your lender is important. Your relationship with a, a broker is important. Who has long term relationships that can, in a pinch. Call upon those relationships. Your teammates are important. Making sure that you have the right fit, um, the relationship. The uh, do they have the net worth, the liquidity, the experience? Okay, and really taking a look at that before making sure you have your education and being a limited partner. So that's all I have for today. Totally, totally agree. Do you have a minute for me to kind of go through some of the questions that I like? Sure. To oh, yes. I think some of them you've already answered uh, in, in really quite well. So I'll, I'll maybe just get you get you for, for two of them. Anyway, maybe. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> First Happy. one uh, is just based on the name of the show uh, being know your why. So, so what's your why, Julie? What, why do you why do you do this? Why have you, you know, sort of drive yourself to this level of success? You know, um, hmm, I would tell you that I spent too much time in single family. I always wanted to leverage and I didn't get the leverage that I had that was there. I didn't take advantage of it. And so with that, my why is to help other people who to help recognize how to do this business. My why is to be the lender that doesn't say go away. You don't have any experience. Go away, come back when you get, you know, get some relationships. My why is to connect people to become as successful in this industry as possible. Uh, along the way, of course, it, it, I, I benefit from that as well. Sure. Uh, I, just, I just love being able to help other people. Yeah. And, and you don't have to... <laughs> helping other people and having that also benefit you is not a bad thing. That's that <laughs> it can, it can, they can both happen at the same time. That's, that's for sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Reasonable. Um, okay. When people hear this, what is, uh, what is the best way for them to reach out to you when they want to connect? Yeah. So I'm on all social media. I'm very active in social media. Um, LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Facebook. You can reach me through those messenger. Um, you can certainly call me. I'm happy to have a, a conversation with you. I love having conversations uh, one-on-one. Uh, my phone number is 630-453-7150. All my contact information is on all of those, just in case uh, you know, you'll know you find it on the, uh, more information on, on those sites. Okay. And you mentioned the, the Zoom at eight as well, right? That's Zoom at a, eight. Do I have my Zoom at eight shirt oh, on? Do. Check that Very out. Good. Zoom at eight. Every Very Tuesday good. night, everybody. It's eight o'clock Eastern. And uh, we have, as I mentioned, real life ec- experts in this field that want to help you understand whether it is property management, whether it's software, whether it's understanding how to set up a fund. You can come learn and join in networking every Tuesday night. Love to see you. Perfect. Well, let me end it with one final question. What mm-hmm. what parting piece of advice would you give to people that are getting started in the industry? I know you said you like to like to help those that are getting started. So there is yeah. there you've given so much advice already, but is there one thing yeah. that you think is is key to them? Well, kind of really I think going? yeah, I think this comes through the process. And the process is where do I fit in? What are my strengths? I didn't know. While I love conversation and I love uh, visiting with people, I didn't know that my strength in a deal is the capital raising. I thought it was just you know the back, uh, maybe the asset management or working with the property management or setting that up. My Real skill is capital raising. I I capital raised four million dollars without even knowing that that was, you know, what I brought to a team. So in this, figure out what your you've heard people say this. There's your superpower, and it took me a while. And it wasn't until I got into a deal that and I needed to, 
you know, pull all stops out that this truly was what was making me tick was was being a capital raiser. So in the quietness of your mind and in your heart, what is it that drives you? If you don't want to talk to people, then you're not a capital raiser. But maybe you are more of a the numbers guy, or maybe you're really good with conflict where you could go and talk to the property management company, right? So you got to kind of have that self reflection and time and openness and you know ask people what is where do you think that i fit and go after that and find your partners knowing this is your superpower super helpful love it i love it that's great i think uh, very very important to be self aware for sure so mm-hmm. and it might take some trial or, trial and error to figure out what you <laughs> you may think what your superpower is may not may not Absolutely. be actually what it is you, you, right. but, but figuring that yeah. out i think it is key to, to to being successful well Thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, so much, I feel like we could talk for a long, long time. So yeah. we'll we'll uh, we'll stop here and and maybe we'll do it again sometime soon because I think there's just Love so it. much more that people can learn from you. Um, oh, thanks. So so again, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Talk soon. Right. Bye bye. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.